Good evening, everyone. My name is Amanda Thomas, and I would like to welcome you to Science on Tap Online. And we are here for a special event, which is I'm on the front lines of COVID-19, ask me anything. And this is special for us because one, we have never done an all Q&A event before. And two, um, we haven't done a COVID related event before. So I, I have been uh, specifically avoiding COVID topics because I wanted to um, bring you some more uh, lighthearted things uh, to learn about science. But we had a lot of people asking us to talk about this topic. So here we are, and I'm glad you're here joining us this evening. Um, I've invited two experts to join us this evening. We have Dr. Guy Shohat, who is a professor and emergency care physician at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, he has special interest in managing emergency conditions that affect the airways, and his research includes gathering data on emergency intubation. And we also have Dr. Maayan Simkis, who is an epidemiology, uh, epidemiologist with the Washington State Department of Health. And she has been on the COVID-19 incident management uh, team since January and oversees training for all case and contact investigators working with the Department of Health. They have both been heavily involved using science to address and respond to COVID-19. Um, and my goal tonight is to offer you, our viewers, an opportunity to ask them some questions uh, based around science, because I'm sure you have a lot of them. And depending on the number of questions we have, we'll probably go to about around 8 p.m., probably about an hour. Um, I already have some questions that were submitted by email for uh, some people, and so I'm going to start out with some of those. But if you have questions, um, well, I'll tell you in a minute how you can submit those to us. And be aware that there may be some areas of that are outside their expertise, but we'll try and, and get to uh, questions that they can answer um, and, and give you all the information you need about that. And also a, uh, a quick disclaimer that statements by our scientists this evening are based on their own expertise and experience and don't necessarily represent the views of their respective agencies. So before we get started with the actual q and I want to tell you a couple quick things. First of all, Science on Tap is an event, some of you may be new to us, um, and we have been running Science on Tap here in Portland, Oregon and Vancouver, Washington for about seven years. And our goal is to make science accessible, fun and meaningful, especially for adults. And True to our name, please feel free to enjoy a tasty beverage of your choice during our event this evening. Um, normally we would be in a theater like the lovely Alberta Rose Theater, um, as you can see on the screen here, all enjoying our beverages of choice, but we will have to do that um, in our own homes this evening. So thank you. Uh, I hope you are able to enjoy something. And then um, Finally, we, well, not finally, but um, <laughs> we are trying to make these events free and uh, our podcasts free for as many people as possible to, to watch live and also to make them available on YouTube, but we can't do that without your donations and we are grateful for donations of any size and I will tell you at the end, we'll have some links on how to um, donate to us and be really appreciative of that. And um, I would love to welcome our guests this evening. Again, we have Dr. Guy Shohat um, and Dr. Mayan Simkis. Welcome. Hooray. I would, I would love to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and give us a little bit more information on who you are and, and what your area of expertise is. So Mayan, why don't you go ahead first? Great. Thanks, Amanda. Well, I'm excited to be back. This is my third Science on Tap event, but I've had about a five-year hiatus in between this and the last couple. I used to be based in Portland. I spent two years working at the Multnomah County Health Department as an Applied Epidemiology Fellow. So I got to spend uh, the years of our Ebola outbreak response efforts here in the United States, 20 13 through 2016, 2015 in Portland, Oregon, and I am quite fond of the city. Um, my background, as you've heard, is in epidemiology. I spent my uh, undergraduate years studying community health, moving into a master's in epidemiology back home in St. Louis, where I'm from. And once I moved out to the Northwest, like many of you are aware, if you live out here, I decided to never leave. I'm sorry, I'm one of those people who came and said, you're stuck with me. 
Uh, so now I live out just south of the Seattle area and I work for the State Department of Health. I've been here for just under a year. I was doing my PhD before that in epidemiology and my background's a little all over the place. Everything from infectious disease response work to um, opioids and naloxone and violence and injury, mental health. Uh, so a little bit all over the place. And I was brought on to work in our COVID response uh, because we needed more epidemiologists. And I happened to have a lot of background working on Ebola response efforts in Oregon. And so I was put to work. So the past several months, I have played a few different roles within our agency's response effort. But since April, my primary role has been overseeing all of the training for investigators who are responsible for calling people when they test positive for COVID-19 or if they're exposed to somebody who has COVID-19. So if you've received one of those calls in the state of Washington, it was probably somebody I trained, unless they were calling from a local health jurisdiction, and that's a whole other story we can talk about. So that's me. Great, thank you. Uh, Guy, can you give us an introduction? Absolutely. So my name is Guy Shohad. I'm an emergency physician at UCSF in San Francisco, though I live in the East Bay in Berkeley. I did my uh, medical school in Montreal, McGill University, and then my emergency medicine training at Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn. And the last 20 years, I've been at the University of San Francisco Emergency Department, um, with also some uh, time spent at Kaiser Oakland and at the Trauma Center Highland Hospital in Oakland. Um, my main focus in emergency medicine uh, for the last 20 years has been uh, emergency airway management, um, teaching it, devices, and the last 10 years I've focused more actually on late career physicians, so helping uh, mid and late career emergency medicine physicians who have been sort of spooked by new technologies have been sort of demystifying those technologies. And then about two years ago, I had a radical uh, career shift where I became a health informaticist. So I managed the um, electronic health record for my department. And so basically learning a new language at 50. Um, and so although I'm not on the incident, was not on the incident command team at UCSF, um, because I sort of direct two things that were very COVID intensive, airway and the electronic health record, I ended up sort of by default doing a lot of COVID things for our department. Um, so thank goodness I did not have to be in direct leadership for this this one, and so a lot of a lot of things had to change very quickly from an informatics point of view. Actually, in response to COVID, things like signaling internally who is at what point in testing, who's a positive, who's a negative, who's a maybe. This all had to be done on the fly in real time, and similarly, our entire approach to airway management had to change overnight with very little data. Um, and that so it's been a very interesting six months. I can't hear you. Whoops. Yeah. Sorry about that. I'm, yeah. Um, what I was saying was uh, <laughs> kind of ironic that I'm hearing in the chat that both of you are a little bit quiet. So if you, okay. um, yeah, um, that would be wonderful. Uh, so everyone can hear and I will try and remember to use my unmute button. Lots of questions about a lot of different topics, and I'm going to start with masks because everybody is being told that they should wear them, and but are they good for the people who are wearing them or the people around them or homemade masks, N95s? Please tell us what we should know about masks. Yeah, there's quite a lot to know. I'm going to answer briefly and I'm going to hit it over to Guy and see what, what I missed. So when it comes to masks, the messaging early on was kind of wonky. The public from the CDC to your local level that people shouldn't really be wearing masks. It's not essential. And the reason is because people were jumping to get those N95s and get those surgical masks and wear them. And we were running into supply chain issues. We were running out of resources for our frontline healthcare staff. So that was the first initial issue. And I think it actually led to some confusing messaging down the line when it comes to mask wearing. So what you saw over the following months was a push more for people to make homemade masks or ordering them online in some sort of fabric format. Every company has come up with their own version. And the reality is that not every mask is created equal. The more layers you have of fabric, the better they are at protecting you as an individual. And it is important to wear them. They are effective at helping to, to prevent the spread of disease, but they're not perfect. 
And part of that has to do with people not really knowing how to wear the masks. So masks good, wearing masks correctly better. I'll leave it to Guy now. <laughs> okay, masks, by the way, I turned off my audio. Is that better now? Excellent. So I think in the, the simplest thing, I agree, mask use was highly underplayed at the beginning of, uh, of the pandemic. In very simple terms, you wear a mask in public to protect others. We wear specialty masks in the hospital to protect ourselves. Um, so yeah, uh, the, the people saying, I, I'm not afraid, I don't need to wear a mask. That's not why you're wearing a mask. You're wearing a mask to help stop transmission. Um, any mask will do. There is some, a little bit of recent question about buffs and we could go into that in detail later, but really we don't know the answers, but having some sort of fabric between you and the people you're breathing on is gonna be somewhat effective. More layers is better. Harder to breathe through is better. Having it, as Marianne said, tight around your nose and not easy to eject up the outside is going to help. There's not a whole lot of reason for you walking around the street to be wearing an N95. Um, do we want to go into even more detail about masks with vents and all of that, Amanda? Um, let's, we've got a lot of different subjects to cover, so I think we'll hold off on that right now. Um, and just to you who are watching, if you see me looking off to the side or down, I'm, I'm looking at the computer with all of your questions, so I apologize if that is distracting. Um, but I'm going to ask you, Guy, we, we talked about briefly in, uh, in pre-show, you were talking about the difference between aerosols in the scientific and the colloquial sense and how there's perhaps some um, challenging messaging around what aerosol that term means. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I think that there's been a lot of misunderstanding by the public when scientists and doctors are fighting back and forth of, is this, is this virus aerosolized? Is this transmitted by aerosol means? Um, and I think that the misunderstanding is for most people, this virus is transmitted as aerosol means it's transmitted through the air. There is no question that this virus is transmitted through the air, that by talking to someone across the room from them, you can transmit it to them. When we say the term aerosol, we mean something very, very specific. And it, it involves it being able to live literally floating through the air, but not attached to respiratory droplets. And this is, and this affects how we, what type of masks we wear, what type of isolation rooms we put people in, whether we need special negative pressure filters. This, this is very important to us. This isn't terribly important to the general public. I think that when people, when they hear scientists like me arguing, I'm not a scientist, I'm a physician, but arguing this is not aerosolized, we're just arguing some very specific internal stuff. We are not saying this is not transmitted through the air is absolutely transmitted through the air. It's just transmitted through the air through little micro droplets, through little respiratory droplets. And I, I think that's a sort of a very important one. And let us, if, by all means, if you want to talk about it, we'll talk about what aerosol means, but understand that you breathing out little respiratory droplets is how the majority of transmission happens, not from touching the surface, although that certainly works as well. And that's why the, the mask wearing is so very important. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit more about transmission. We've had a lot of questions about um, fomites specifically, which if you could, one of you, please uh, define what a fomite is, but I'll also talk about you know, surface transmission and, and how likely that kind of thing is. And should we be disinfecting all of our groceries when we bring them home? Yeah. All right, I'll take the first swing. So a fomite is an object that is contaminated with the virus. We would call something a fomite like um, a cup that somebody picks up after they've coughed on their hand and they've touched the cup and it's now on this cup. This is now a fomite. Same thing for a doorknob or the handle when you're getting onto the bus and you're trying not to fall and you're hanging on. So a fomite really is just saying a hard surface, not a living person, that is contaminated and can then go on to infect another person when they touch it. Now, what's important to remember is COVID is not one of those viruses that magically absorbs into your body when you touch it. The answer is you have to touch it and then actually has to be ingested in the body either through the mouth or it goes through the eye or you can breathe it in through your nose. 
it is not something that you're just going to soak up through the skin. So what does it mean to have a fomite nearby you? If you go ahead and touch that cup and then you forget to wash your hand and you go rub your eye, right? That's a potential opportunity for you to become infected. That's a route of transmission. And we've been talking a little bit already about what happens when we have uh, coughing, sneezing, talking, that airborne transmission. This is just a different kind of transmission. And like I said, it's not as common. Viruses like to spread through the air. It makes it easier for them to spread. They do a better job of perpetuating themselves throughout the population. So fomites, yes, there is transmission. And actually, we've also seen some transmission through fecal matter, although it's kind of rare as well. But most of the time, what we're seeing is not fomite transmission. But it's still possible. So do you need to uh, clean all your groceries like a just pour the bleach all over them? Probably not. Probably not, but if you are a high risk community member and you have particularly high risk needs related to your immune system, the guidance will probably be a little bit different and you'd most likely wanna work with your healthcare provider to figure out exactly the right recommendations. Excellent. Yeah, I agree. I think that we just think of it simply as mo most of where the virus is coming out of your body is not, it's not living on your skin, it's coming out of your respiratory secretions. So if you talk loudly and produce a little saliva, that's gonna produce more. If you sing, that's gonna throw a bunch out or shout. If you sneeze, that's going to be this just wonderful virus generator. But at the same time, if you sneeze on a surface and then some like, or on the food of the person sitting across from you in a restaurant, that's gonna be a problem. If you sneeze on a surface and someone touches that surface and then eats a French fry without washing their hands, that's gonna be a problem. This is where hand washing or alcohol on your hands becomes very effective um, that's, that's much easier than, than sort of radically trying to clean every surface. If you can keep your hands clean after touching things before touching your face or touching your food, that's a great start. And this is also where masks are just so, so helpful. Having a simple barrier across your mouth is great. Um, there's a really interesting question in the chat window. I know you're supposed to be doing this, Amanda, but someone said, then cloth and why? <laughs> Cloth mask should also prevent you breathing it in. And because I did, I did sort of leap into masks in order to protect others. That's where it gets more interesting. And maybe I'll let Mayan, do you want to talk about like? You go ahead. Okay. Um, so, I mean, surgical masks or those little funny paper things are actually really fascinating. They're not just pieces of paper, they're pretty highly designed with, they actually have, they carry a certain electric charge that will help actually trap little particles as they try to enter. So that they're actually, unless they get really uh, visibly soiled, they're actually incredibly effective at preventing droplets from, from entering inside. And we found that just, in fact, a simple, for, fa for most of uh, healthcare associated things, we actually don't need N95s in a lot of cases. Just a simple face shield and a surgical mask can be incredibly effective in protecting us as long as we also wear gowns use gloves and clean our hands constantly. So we don't, when we're taking off our own mask, just give ourselves COVID. And this has been a real problem with people taking off their N95 with dirty gloves. Um, so while cloth masks are protective, they're not nearly as protective. If someone does sneeze or pops in, droplets are in the air, they certainly can get through a cloth mask, much less so if the cloth mask has multiple layers. So I know that's sort of a bit of a non-answer, but. Well, I guess the last piece of it is that, you know, we've, we've all been hearing about 15 minutes, six feet, right? So you're considered a contact of somebody who's been exposed or who has COVID if you spent at least 15 minutes within about six feet of them. And part of that six feet distance comes from estimates of how well these respiratory droplets are spreading, right? So if you're wearing a cloth mask, but you're also Away, standing at least six feet away from somebody else and they're wearing a cloth mask, your risk of actually being infected is quite a lot lower than if only one of you has a mask or neither of you. And, and once you take it outside and the air can dissipate that, then everything changes dramatically. And this is why it's much harder to transmit it outside. And I was going to ask Maya on actually a question. So in these transmissions that happen, say, at where people gather at the beach, I've been wondering a lot about this myself, and maybe it's just conjecture. My guess is what's going on is either people are getting relatively, even though they're outside, they're getting relatively close and sp either excited and speaking out loud or speaking louder because it's loud outside, or they're drinking a lot and they're speaking louder, or they're sharing food on a picnic blanket. 
And so there, maybe fomites start to become a real issue because you're handing each other beers or sharing food because you're excited to be outside with your friends again. Yeah, I think you nailed it. The only other idea that I would have is, is all of the shared bathroom facilities that are always at those beaches, if, be it a porta potty or some other bathroom facility, if it hasn't been shut down and it isn't being sanitized very regularly, you run into fomite transmission there as well. But my, I suspect that's exactly it. People are just kind of forgetting and they're getting really close to each other. Yeah, there's several questions about gatherings, either just a couple people outside or a group of people outside. You know, if, if you're wearing a mask, is that okay? Or if you're having dinner across a table from somebody outside, is that okay or not? Any more thoughts about those kinds of things? You know, it's a very personal question and it's also gonna depend. So it's personal in that it depends on your own health and your own family health needs. So if you have a family member who's immunocompromised, you're going to make very different decisions than a household where everyone is under the age of 30, has no underlying health conditions, and isn't really concerned about their immune system. Uh, let's, let's make this personal for me. I don't intend to eat in a restaurant for a very long time, and I have not done so since January of this year. Um, if that gives you a little bit of perspective. Now, I live in a state where we have counties that are moving into different phases of reopening. In fact, the county I live in has open dining rooms with reduced capacity. I still won't eat in them personally because we know for all the reasons we've already described that the risk of transmitting via fomites or by air to the person at the table six feet away from you or the person who's maybe in the booth behind you that's five feet away, still pretty high. Um, does that mean that you can't have gatherings of people? No, of course not. I think there are, are risks that we have to be uh, willing to understand and, and take ourselves. So if I wanna visit a friend who I haven't seen in a long time, I really have to think about it. Is it worth putting that person and myself at risk by putting us in the same space? And if we do decide to enter the same space together, how can I maximize safety? So Guy talked about the benefits of being outside and that's key. So in Washington, some of our guidance is that if you want to have gatherings with people outside of your household, the recommendation is, first of all, keep the number small. Try to keep it under five people a week who you're actually seeing, and preferably keep it to your own bubble. Find the people you're always going to be in touch with, know who they're in touch with, and keep it a small unit. And then still, when you're outside, keep six feet apart and wear masks as much as possible. Are there exceptions? Sure. And I think it's a very personal choice. I do think that um, there are certain factors that might play into it aside from your immune system. It might be also your job. If you, for example, have a high risk job uh, that could make you more likely to be an asymptomatic case, meaning you could potentially infect other people without knowing it, you might make a different decision if you have a high risk job, or maybe you're an essential worker and you work in a hospital and you wanna also make sure that you're able to go to work. So there's so many different pieces that play into it. And I think ultimately, you know, I can tell you what I'm doing. I haven't actually spent in-person time with friends in several months and I have no intention of eating at a restaurant anytime soon. But if I need to go to the grocery store and make a trip to Costco, I put on my mask and make sure I have my hand sanitizer in my pocket and bring a little wipe so I can wipe down my cart myself and I go out. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that I'm in basically zero rush to do any sort of indoor events. Um, I, while I desperately miss these things, um, I, but I think socializing outside is wonderful. I think walking, going for bike rides, those sorts of things are fantastic. I have certainly hosted people on my patio and in my backyard and gone to theirs. Though I did start to see that, I, it's funny, I came to the same number, five or six people is sort of the magic number. I can even see as it got there, beyond that it gets a little out of control. It's hard to, it gets exciting. It's hard to not instantly get in, into other people's faces. And if you add any degree of alcohol or intoxicants, things start to break down. I've watched this, things break down very, very quickly. If you go to any sort of big city park on a sunny day, you watch how this all falls apart really quickly. Um, but I think most outdoor activities with relatively small groups, super safe, super good, just don't forget, don't, don't start. It's so easy to 
hey, you want some of my Coke or my water bottle or even on a bike ride? But I think in general, that's that's quite safe. Whereas for my parents who are uh, 79 and 80, I have very different rules when they ask me, how should we go about it? I'm like, nope, you don't need to, you know, you don't need to do any of this. You're fine. Go for a walk. You know, if you want to socialize with us on the porch, that's one thing. But and similarly for my for my kids in their 20s, I, you know, they have a slightly, I think, higher tolerance than me. But I'm still reminding them that they don't want to start being the spread of this. So many questions. Um, I'm trying to, to weed through. Uh, oh, I see a mass events question, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of uh, trying to, to pick out some commonalities. A um, couple questions about testing. And for example, if uh, somebody goes to an event or a, a workplace or something where they have to take a test in order to be um, admitted, is that legit or does that lead to a sense of overconfidence? Um, how um, effective are those tests and or, you know, are there ones that are better than others that, that people should be looking for? Um, tell us what you know about tests. I think that's you. Oh, it's me? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to opine, but I think your knowledge is better on this one. Uh, okay, we'll both have sure. to swing at this one again. So, Testing is a big question and it's been in the news a lot in the last 24 hours because some of the CDC guidance around testing uh, has been changed. I'm not going to say that CDC technically changed it. It was essentially changed due to some uh, encouragement from federal government uh, and it was not actually based on, I think, what leadership at uh, the Centers for Disease Control really wanted to do. So that's been in the news a lot lately uh, and that really gets at the idea of who needs to be tested and when? And the second part of the question, Amanda, that you ask is what are the types of tests essentially and, and how good are they? So when we think about testing and how we define somebody as either being a confirmed case, having confirmed COVID or not, we rely on one kind of test. That is a PCR test. This essentially looks for viral genetic matter, RNA, in the body. The PCR test is our gold standard for COVID-19. The other test that you hear the most about is going to be a test for immunity, right? It's going to be an antibody test. And this is looking to see, has your immune system started to respond to the presence of the virus recently, in the past? Now, when we are looking at data coming into a health department and we say, okay, somebody has tested positive for COVID, the only time when we actually are going, at least in the state of Washington, and I think in, in Oregon and probably most states, the only time that we immediately activate in order to call somebody and get in touch with them is for a PCR positive test. So our case definition at the federal level for COVID-19 is having a positive PCR test for COVID. The other tests, the antibody tests, the various rapid tests, they're not as effective. They're not as reliable. So there are a few different measures that we use for test effectiveness. There's things called sensitivity and specificity. We also think about um, false negatives and false positives. So these words may sound familiar, but they're all getting at the same idea. How good is this test at telling me that I actually truly have or don't have a particular disease? And in this case, the most reliable test is that PCR test. It's that nasty swab that goes up your nose and maybe swirls around back in your brain a little bit. Although lately we've been moving more towards just the nasal swabs, but that is the most reliable test. The question about being tested to see if you're negative before you walk into a, a doctor's office or go to an event or whatever it might be, mixed. Um, they can only be so reliable. The question is, um, in my mind, do we want to put our faith in a test that is less trustworthy when we're walking into those spaces? And the reality is, you know, they're there because we need something fast sometimes, just like when you get a rapid flu test and you get a response in just a few minutes or a couple of hours. And the PCR tests can take longer. They're longer. They take, they take uh, longer to run, the longer for the results to come back from the laboratory, where uh, results coming from a fast test are literally fast. That's why it's called a rapid test, right? So ideally, you're going to be seeking out those more permanent, not permanent, excuse me, the more reliable PCR tests. And if your job is telling you you have to have a negative one before you go back, it's a mixed bag. In some ways, it's a 
kind of like a CYA moment, cover your ass, right? Like you're trying to make sure that you are attending, your, your work is um, trying to make sure people are only there who are actually negative, but there's really no great way to do that. Tests are unreliable. And I'll say one more thing about the antibody tests, uh, and that is that the antibody tests we have right now are not great, partially because there are so many different coronaviruses and people often forget, we only learned about this coronavirus in December of this year. That's not a lot of time for innovation and development within the clinical world and the scientific world. So everything we're doing is based on only a handful of months of information, let alone right how long it's been in the United States. So antibody tests, rapid tests, if you really want to know truly if you are infected with COVID, the answer is to rely on those PCR tests. Yeah. Agree. <laughs> Do you have anything else you want to add to that guy? Yeah. This, I mean, this is a great example of the public getting to see the way medicine and science really happens in real time. They're used to stuff that we have 40 years of experience with, like strep, strep testing, which we know it's okay, but we know exactly in which ways it's bad or good. And in this, we're sort of learning in real time. And they get to sort of watch how we, we try to figure these things out on the fly. Um, it's really disappointing to us that this test is mostly accurate. There's not a lot of false positives. So most time when it says you have COVID, you probably do. It is rare. I can talk about that in a second. When, but it's, it's pretty rare if it says you have COVID and you don't. But it's unfortunately, still a significant part of the time, maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe in some places more percent of the time, it says you don't have COVID and you do. And is that because the test is bad or is that because you have less of it floating around in your nose? We don't know. And this is why for really serious situations, we test you twice or even three times if we really think you have it. Um, and sometimes we'll do something more intensive like get a sample from your trachea, not from your nose. We really, really think you have it and we need to understand. Whereas at other times, we, even in the hospital, we'll just use a rapid test if we need to because we think you're low risk and we just want that extra, that extra quick answer. Um, it's really hard, but we, we certainly are, we are only, we're testing the new rapid tests right now because they constantly come up with new ones and we think we have a new one that might be interesting now at UCSF that we're cross-testing with the PCR and comparing, but mostly the PCR is where it's at. And unfortunately, even with the good ones, up to 20% of the time, it's still gonna miss. So if you have symptoms that sound like COVID, we're still gonna treat you. We're gonna just still assume you have it. And even our discharge instructions say, just because your test is negative, you still need to be careful here. You have some sort of respiratory virus that you don't wanna pass on to anyone just out of politeness, and it still might be COVID. And guys, right, that's what we say at Department of Health as well. So if you have COVID symptoms and you have a known exposure to COVID, even if you test negative, we are going to tell you to act like you have COVID and we're going to treat you exactly as if you had tested positive. I, and this is more politics and less science, but the it's very sad right now that our COVID testing capacity is so bad that there are huge delays. Because if you get a test but you don't get the results back for seven days, then from my perspective, that's almost a useless test. Like what have you done? Um, unless you've been really good and then self-quarantined waiting for those seven days, most people just hang out and do whatever they're doing for those seven days and their contact trace list just got a mile long while they were waiting to find out what their test was. And whenever I've tried to get a test outside of my hospital, it's been really interesting seeing how hard it is for the general public to just get a test. Yeah. Um, one last thing, this is, this is less science and more just what we refer to as anecdotal, just things I've noticed. I've seen now two examples of uh, cases where a COVID test came back positive that was really unexpected, and then the retest was negative. And so the presumption was this was what we call a false positive. They never had COVID, the test was wrong. And both times, this was from a private for-profit urgent care in the community. And so I don't know that I'm not going to put judgment on this, but I am <laughs> that I've noticed most public health groups, most hospitals are using pretty solid tests. Um, most big medical groups, um, Kaiser, what have you, are using tests. But I'm wondering if some of these smaller private uh, organizations either can't afford or just going with these kind of small lab tests that are maybe not that great. 
And so who you get your test with counts. And I would probably go for in general tests that are being sponsored by either bigger groups or your local public health group. Like, so even the free test coming from city of Berkeley, I very much trust. Mm -hmm. Whereas the little not for very, maybe slick, you can, you can get an appointment online. Uh, ones from your local for-profit urgent care might not be that good, or they might be if you trust them. Your comment about watching science happen real time is something I've been thinking a lot about, and we've had some questions about the, the development of a vaccine. And should we trust it? Is it going too fast? Is it not going fast enough? Um, what are your thoughts on, on the COVID vaccine? And also, what are your thoughts on the flu vaccine this year? Oh, neat. Uh, we just got a notification at work last week that they want every single person at UCSF, not just hospital, it sounds like a campus wide to get a flu shot this year by November 1st, which is much early, which is early. Um, I mean, I usually, we usually get ours way before that anyway, but they want, but they want everyone to not just be offered it, but to have had it to work um, in this sense. And their argument is the last thing we need to be is taxing the system with more flu cases. Um, it's interesting. I think that they're, I think they're also culturalizing the importance of vaccines and there's all sorts of good stuff here. I, I, there's not so far a whole lot of interaction apparently between influenza and COVID per se, but on an average year, uh, influenza is a huge, it's the biggest tax we have regularly yearly on the healthcare system. Um, and we sort of brace for flu season every year in the emergency department. So we are huge proponents of flu vaccination. And I'm hoping that one of many silver linings from this is increased awareness of the importance of vaccination, increasing culturalization, socialization of vaccination, and hopefully lots more people getting vaccines in general, especially yearly flu vaccines. It's a shame that you have to get flu vaccines every year, but the nature of the mutability of flu, at least with present vaccine technology, demands it. So that comment you just made, Guy, ties directly into the issues with the COVID vaccine. We don't really know what the mutation potential is going to be with this virus in the long run. And so designing a vaccine that's going to be effective for what's circulating now, first of all, it takes a long time. Vaccine trials last for a long time. So could we be going faster? Probably not. Should we be going faster? No. We should be taking our time to actually do this right. And it's hard to know what right is going to be when you're on such a short timeline. And we also don't understand what immunity really looks like for people who have been infected for, with COVID. We can look at short-term immunity, but we can't look at long-term immunity for a virus that hasn't been around for the long term. It's only been here for a handful of months. So for us to really understand the dynamics of this virus within the body in relation to the immune system and designing the right vaccine, it's rather complicated. And any vaccine that we develop needs to go through the right vetting and the right proper trials for vaccines prior to being released to the public. And one of the reasons for that that I think is most important, aside from, of course, all of the safety concerns, is that if we were to release a vaccine and the public health world and the government were to push it and say, this is great, it's the COVID vaccine, everybody get it, everybody goes out, they get vaccinated, and then a few months later, we say, uh-oh, it didn't work, we're sorry, but we're going to make a new one. How many people are actually going to trust in their public health and governmental leaders to go back and get another vaccine? So it's important for us to maintain that trust and build the culture that Guy is talking about when it comes to vaccination as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Contrary to some popular pop culture belief, vaccines are some of the safest things out there despite the fact that they're doing something incredibly scientifically dangerous, which is tweaking your immune system. But the reason they are is because we test these things so intensively and so long-term because that's what you have to do with something that you're gonna voluntarily give to every healthy person. Um, and that's why I, I laugh when I see these news reports of, new vaccines will come quickly and they will be first offered to first responders and the first responders are like, no thanks, I'm gonna wait for testing. <laughs> so um, yeah, final thoughts on vaccines. And of course we're waiting for them. 
Mayan, <laughs> we, we talked about this a little bit beforehand, and you mentioned something about um, some of the messaging that's coming from various uh, federal agencies. And <laughs> I, we, we got a question before that I, I sent you, and it said, despite what we hear in the press, I'm hopeful that there are functional groups working at the state, national, and international levels of COVID. Who and what groups are working well together and who are not? Where are advances being made, information being shared, and the science and organizations that are working well together? Where are they not? Such a beautiful question, and there are so many parts. So I'm going to try to get at the heart of the question and then tell me if I veered off our path too much, Amanda. So I think what's at the core here is, first of all, how does public health operate? Who really has a say in what things are being done? And who has just enough power to kind of throw a wrench in things? So let's start at the local level. In Washington and Oregon, we are both considered decentralized states, which means that the local health jurisdiction, the local health department, has the authority to invite the state jurisdiction, the state health department, in to assist with investigations and public health work. So if you live in Multnomah County, Multnomah County Health Department is going to be making decisions around public health, working with Multnomah County leadership, and if help is needed, they will ask the Oregon Health Authority to come in and assist. Same thing in Washington and same in many other states around the country. Other states are set up differently where that centralized power is with the uh, state agency and they actually have a little bit more oversight. And I believe that's how it is in Texas, but don't quote me on that. So what does that mean in terms of agencies working together? It means really that the local agencies and the state agencies are working very closely in lockstep at all times. This is because of how cases and, and uh, laboratory results are getting reported into our various systems in different states. Electronic lab reporting comes in actually at the state level in Washington. And that information is pushed through a Washington state level system that then pushes out to the county so that they can receive that information and use it. Similar systems exist or variations on that around the country. And so working closely between state and local government is essential and has been really the hallmark of success, I guess, um, the real sign of success in most of these states where we're seeing good work, state and locals working closely together. Uh, in previous response efforts, we've seen a lot of coordination come from the uh, Centers for Disease Control. So in our Ebola response, one of the uh, important features was that we really were tracking international travel and flights that people took once they had been exposed to Ebola virus or if they uh, were later identified as having been ill or exposed to an ill person. That coordination between various, uh, they're called quarantine centers or uh, quarantine stations for the Centers for Disease Control, that was all really managed at the federal level through the centers, through the CDC. It's not really happening now. At this point, the juice isn't really worth the squeeze for tracking flights and when people are traveling. It was a little bit more earlier on in the response and CDC was involved in that, but less so now. What folks are probably noticing is some of the messaging coming from the federal level is not exactly the same as what we are seeing at the state and local level. And more importantly, when I say federal level, I'm talking CDC, we're talking Health and Human Services, NIH, right? And then we also have our White House. So the messaging is different from different places and it can make work more challenging. And I think the heart of this question really is how well are we actually responding to this given some of those challenges and communication and partnership across these agencies? And the answer is that it varies depending on where you are. There are some states where we have seen tremendous success where we have seen cases actually decrease very rapidly, particularly for some of our tribal nations who have implemented outstanding contact tracing programs. We have seen illnesses drop uh, really rapidly and the disease has been all, all but halted. And there have been other states, namely in the Southeastern United States, I'll point my finger at Florida today, where there is a lot of spread of disease and it has to do with disconnect between the state level leadership and science. So it's not just disconnect between the government agencies that are all operating, it is also a disconnect from scientific data. And of course, with the folks on this call, I'm sure you are very well aware that a disconnect from science doesn't necessarily mean that people have malintent. It can often be people don't understand, or frankly, that we as the scientists are not doing a good job of conveying information. And that is the hallmark of an epidemiologist. We are not great at 
sometimes sharing information and uh, it can be a communication challenge. So I'm trying single-handedly to fix that for my entire profession. Um, so there's a lot that comes into play here. And I think ultimately we have to look at the challenges that sometimes come from above and recognize that we have in the uh, Wizard of Oz sense, we have what we have always needed all along. And that is the science. We need our leadership at this point across the country and at all different levels of government to understand, acknowledge, and embrace the scientific evidence that we have in front of us to really stop the spread of the disease. Guy, do you have anything? Yeah, I, I do. I have something on a, that was amazing. Um, I want to add a whole, diff, a little different side, which is the, the informal communication that's happened outside of these agencies. And that's been really interesting in the way internet and other medias have helped uh, spread uh, sort of communication and thought processes in responding to a novel threat like this. So I'm unfortunately old enough to have been on the tail end of the, or the, the tail end of the worst part of the HIV epidemic and saw the, the terrible communication that was going on that time, the very poor late spread and very late development and a lot of frustration, very poor communication with the public over new th things. That was a sort of a tragic period in health, but in, at the same time, late but wonderful victory over a with a lot of the, of the, the drugs. I remember noticing when, when MRSA, when methicillin resistant Staph aureus hit, so when suddenly we were noticing, we, we all physicians knew about this, this res, drug resistant staph aureus because we'd seen it in drug user, uh, injection drug users, but seeing it in regular suddenly appear in the community was a real shock when it, this happened, I don't know what, 10 years ago. And before any of the papers came out, we already threw in informal means, emergency and infectious disease physicians around the country had already been communicating with each other talking when, during our weekly educational conference, we would say, well, I just talked to someone in Davis, he just talked to someone in New York, and they said this, and we had already on the ground changed a lot of our habits, and we're looking into this before the very first papers were out. And that was the first time I noticed, oh, wow, this, this sort of informal communication now with the digital age is happening much more quickly, and it was neat seeing how quickly a field like emergency medicine could respond to this very weird thing before we even had full data to study, but we had enough smart people all around the country going, are you seeing this? I'm seeing something really weird. So COVID was this times a thousand. We had suddenly this thing hit and it hit in Wuhan. Wuhan, we didn't know. And I got my, my typical weekly emails I got from the CDC. I got a funny notification of be aware of respiratory diseases from Wubei province in China. It's like looking up on the map, where's that? Oh, nothing to worry about. A week later, things are getting scarier, and then it just hits like a disaster in Italy, and we are immediately starting to plan, and the, we didn't have anything from the World Health Organization or the CDC yet, so we got on Zoom calls with mm -hmm. colleagues from Italy, and I was within week one on these calls of, here's how, our, here's how we're doing lung ultrasound in the ICU to look at COVID cases, and here's what we're doing for airway, and we were just through these informal sources, before we had information from CDC and WHO, we had our internal organizations and most uh, academic medicine, medical centers have internal lines of communication with other academic medical centers. We have data from all the universities of California at UCSF and immediately all these different networks were forming and they've gotten very strong in the meantime. I think this will, this will go on further. These will continue to grow past COVID and that, that sort of response was just amazing to watch and super effective. Twitter was really helpful. There's a lot of stuff going on in medical Twitter. Um, a lot of different things. This, just like with AIDS, this had a lot of weird backlash. Sometimes scientists were very, very quick to publish stuff or release pre-published, pre-reviewed stuff that didn't work out. Hydroxychloroquine would be a wonderful example. Um, but in general, I was really impressed at how things worked and what our response was. And it was nice to let the public see it. Where I was disappointed was the public's lack of trust for bigger sources, watching the US pull away from the World Health Organization, watching us neuter our own CDC wasn't easy, but we, uh, we, we certainly still utilize those. I've certainly used the World Health Organization 
recommendations quite a bit and we still use the CDC. But for data, we're still using more, a lot of internal sources as well. When we want to know what's happening across California, we're not necessarily looking at CDC data. We're just asking the other University of California is to share their data and we can get a pretty good, uh, even though we're only looking at university hospitals, we can get a pretty good idea of where COVID is spiking in different parts of the state. And then we similarly, we share data across the country with other, with other emergency departments and other infectious disease groups. I will say that in different states, depending on the robustness of the public health agency at the state level, you will see really neat dashboards, sometimes using Tableau or Power BI that will have a nice, pretty epidemic curve and will show you the distribution of disease in different parts of the state and look at hospitalization. Um, so I know that Washington has a really great platform, so does Oregon. Mm -hmm. And I strongly recommend that if you're interested in the data, go look at the local data. Go look what's coming out of your community. That's perhaps the only time I've ever heard anyone say that Twitter was useful. So I'm just going to say that. <laughs> um, I am more than happy to make fun of Twitter <laughs> at all points, but medical Twitter is fascinating. And that's, that's one quick breaking news is one place Twitter shines. Great. And we are getting close to the eight o'clock hour and we have so many questions. So if it's okay, I'm going to go a little longer because there's, I think this is really useful. We had somebody say that she reads the, uh, the CDC really updates daily and this has been incredibly helpful to her. So um, not too much longer, but a little bit. Um, question, uh, a medical related question related to, well, I guess maybe this would be for both of you. Um, uh, how deaths are reported. There's been some conspiracy theories around, um, yeah, you're laughing, Mayan. Um, <laughs> there, there's been conspiracy theories on both sides of that. It's being overreported, it's being underreported. What's the reality? Guy, you want to swing first? Ooh, I think this is probably something you know more, much more detail about. So I'm going to let you, okay. I, I have more personal theory. I think you actually have numbers, so. Yeah, I do. So <laughs> when it comes to death data, uh, you know, reporting data means, when you report data, you have to think about two pieces. One, what's in your numerator? Everybody go back to third grade, fourth grade math. What's in your numerator? What's in your denominator? What are the cases or the events that we're counting? And what's the population or the source that gave rise to those cases? Okay, so once we keep that in mind, now let's think about deaths. When we think about deaths related to COVID, that's our numerator, people who have died, who have had COVID, what's our denominator? So this is where the confusion comes in. People are either thinking about a denominator that is the number of people who have ever had COVID and the number of people who died, or they're over here and they're thinking, it's the number of people who have COVID over the size of the population. So those are two very different things. The first one is what we would call a case fatality. We're looking at the proportion of people who are cases, who have had illness, who have died. That's a percent, right? What proportions, so let's say 3% of our population who have had COVID have died, whatever the number might be in your particular area. The other is considered a mortality. Now mortality is not the same as case fatality. Mortality is saying how many people died of COVID within the population. So we talk about the mortality from cancer in any particular year could be X number per 200,000 people or however we're deciding to define our denominator. So for COVID, that underlying population, that denominator can look a little different. It can depend how we're defining it. It can be over a particular period of time. We can be looking at a particular location, only a particular country. And then we use that to create that numerator estimate. So a lot of the confusion and all of the conspiracy that comes around is that people don't actually understand the difference between case fatality and mortality. They're completely different values and they tell us different things. Case fatality tells us how likely is this disease more or less to lead to death among people who have it. Well, the mortality is really looking at how much is this disease affecting our population as a whole, right? So two really different values. Guy, do you yeah. wanna jump in? Oh, she got that. <laughs> 
I think that the only thing I would add is that we are absolutely testing every unexpected, we're testing every death, but specifically every unexpected death for COVID. We're trying to gather more data about, at least in my hospital, anyone who dies gets tested for COVID because we are trying to figure this out more and we're trying to not miss these cases. You know, that reminds me of one thing, Guy, and that is that in some states, the definition for deaths, and I actually think it might be the same across the country, that if you die and you test positive for COVID, you are classified as having been a COVID-related death, even if COVID was not the primary cause of death. And so I believe that is being operated across the country right now. I know for sure in Washington. And that can also change the numbers a little bit as well. But frankly, I'd rather have a really wide net and capture everyone so that we can really understand what's happening than try to zero in on that specific cause of death and leave out a bunch of people who have died but also had COVID at the time of their death. Mayan, do you know if in other states or other parts of the country, the Southeast, for example, are they testing all deaths for, with COVID tests? To see I actually don't know. Yeah, I don't know. We have a number of questions, um, kind of going back to what we were talking about at the beginning, uh, personal behavior and what people can do themselves. Had a couple questions, Guy, you mentioned at the beginning um, about when we were talking about fomites and if you cough on somebody's french fries and you eat them, that could be a problem. Um, there's, a, un, we're unsure, are, is food an issue? Is stomach acid gonna make that go away? What about if you have a cut on your hand and you touch something that somebody um, sneezed on, but you don't put it on your face? Can you talk about that? Right. So stomach acid is sort of a non-issue because the problem is it has to go through your respiratory tract, through you know tongue, cheeks, throat, all these what we call mucosal surfaces, these wet surfaces that that's where the virus is going to get into your system or in nasal passages or even into your lungs. It's not, it, this isn't um, a GI virus. This isn't a virus that gives you, I mean, it can give you diarrhea, but it's not, that's not the primary way it's transmitted. And so it's not about it trying to get into your intestines or swelling. It's all about getting into your respiratory tract. So that's a not issue. I do not think it is at all bloodborne. I don't think that having a cut on your finger is an issue, although you know, this is why we wear eye protections, theoretically getting into your eyes, they would be especially sort of this, the conjunctiva, the, the pink part of your eye is a, is a mucosal surface where a virus could certainly get in. But I think primarily this is all about it getting into your nose and into your mouth, Sex. deep into your lungs. Sex question. Right, and there, uh, and I believe it has been, uh, we have seen virus in semen um, and so technically you could call this a tran sexually transmitted disease, but this is not a primary way that the disease is transmitted. And I think you'd be um, just as concerned about getting it just from being face to face with the person uh, as opposed to just having the semen. This could lead to all sorts of other technical questions about sex, but <laughs> you should be just, you should be more, you should be concerned about kissing someone if that's your question. Thank you, Rebecca, for adding that. <laughs> um, other issues related to uh, personal behavior, transit, um, you know, being on a bus, being on a plane, what are some things that people need to know about that? I noticed a bunch of questions about working out at the gym. Um, also, first of all, I have to give you a huge shout out for your science earrings. Those are just yeah. killing it. <laughs> Thank um, you. Uh, and I don't know if you can read, but my shirt says vaccines safe and effective since 1776. Nice. So. I, I know for next time to up my like prop game here. Um, so uh, I think, you know, uh, planes, tr public transit, that's interesting because that's an environment where you can certainly control it to some extent. Um, people ask me about planes all the time. Oof, that's a tough one. If I hadn't, I'm avoiding air travel as much as I can. If I had to travel, uh, the way I would do it personally would be on a flight with no connections, wearing an N95 the whole time. And basically, I'd just be sitting in my chair. I wouldn't be getting up. I wouldn't be taking my mask off. I'd clean my hands. Um, that I, And this gets back to, hey, guy, earlier you said N95s weren't that important. Well, I think once you're in that enclosed an environment for that long, um, then I'm I'm a little more concerned about that stray virus particle floating floating through the air on a respiratory droplet. 
Um, but I, I do think that while I would avoid planes, I don't think that, I think done, you know, if, if you are a relatively low risk patient, then I think that you, you take your own risk. But I, I could see if it's important enough flying in a controlled way for those reasons. <sighs> Public trend. We yeah. need to activate, add two little asterisks. Please, please. So, thoughts about the face shields with a mask for mm -hmm. travel. But the second is, I want to warn everyone, don't go buy an N95 and think that you can just put it on your face and it's going to work. An N95 is a very specific kind of mask that has to be fitted to your face properly by generally somebody who uh, has expertise in specifically mask fitting. So fitting your N95 is how we make sure that it works. And if you have facial hair or if your face is of a different size or shape, your mask might not fit. So don't run for the N95s yet. By the way, this is my vacation beard. I'm clean shaven when I go to work, so my N95 works. There you go. Okay, I want to hear about the face shields. What do you think? Um, interesting. I mean, face shields are crucial for me when I'm at work because I'm concerned about people. I, I have to get up close to people to examine them. They cough on me. They sneeze at me. Um, I think it's certainly helpful, but I don't know how important... I, it's certainly helpful. I think if you were going in the subway and you were higher risk, I think an N95 or not a mask with a face shield would be a great, would be a great thing to do. Mm. I don't know from us. I don't know. That's an interesting one. And I'm not sure. Um, my, my specific concern about the plane was I said, that was the one time I would go for a higher level. Um, would I go on BART right now on our, on our public transit? I would avoid it if I could, but if I had to do it for work, I think that's a place where a surgical mask and a face shield might be a great thing because you just, if you're going to be tightly around people and you don't know when someone's going to be suddenly breathing on your face or worse, let go of a sneeze, that would be, that would be a great place to consider a face shield. Yeah, I would say avoid those busy routes. And if it's a long trip and a busy route, that's a double whammy. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in general, it's hard to say. It's easy for me to say I'm avoiding public transit because I'm in a place where th now that there's no traffic, there's an option to drive. I think if you're in New York City, this becomes a real issue, especially once winter hits and you can't take a city bike everywhere. It also, I mean, it really reflects on our own privilege sitting here to an MD and a PhD, we have a lot of privilege. And so if I'm going to say I'm not going to take public transit, I mean, that assumes that I have another way to get where I need to go. I have a job that allows me maybe to not take transit. So for some people, it is essential. And that's the only way they can get around. And I think it's, it's important for us to remember that those of us who don't need to clog those systems, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we should leave them accessible to the people who really need them, because that is how we help lift up the rest of our community. Yeah, I think that's one of the upsides is because so many people who can are not using transit, transit's relatively empty. And it seems like some initial data out of New York City was saying transit's much safer than we thought. That actually transmission through New York subway uh, by looking at uh, contact tracing of positives seems to be much less of a transmission route than we thought, of it, or that we feared it would be. Um, the... I, going back to the thing of the gym, however, I think that's an interesting question. I think there were five different questions of when can I go back to the gym? How do you think of this setup in my gym? A gym is a real problem. Let's start thinking about what's actually going on there. Now you're talking about a prolonged period in an enclosed space where you have the option not to do it. And what's everybody doing? Everybody's breathing hard. People are breathing hard. People are yelling. Um, this, is, this is similar to... I, to me, this is very similar to that situation of choir practice in an enclosed space. Um, there are water bottles, there's sweat, there's towels, there's hard surface equipment made out of plastic and metal. This, this seems like a perfect situation for transmitting virus. Um, and let's be honest, people who, go, I, I love going to the gym, I get it. People who go to the gym are the people who don't wanna miss a day and that's exactly the, there's going to be people there who are going to be sick and not admitting to them themselves and going i'm still going to the gym anyway because this is really important to me i think these days if you can afford a gym you can afford avoid a you can afford a zoom membership at home to a gym and to work out at home or outside there's people offering a lot of stuff outside i know it's not the same i know how i'm this this it hurts me to say because i'm a 
lifelong proponent of people doing exercise to improve their personal health. But I think being inside in a space, even if you have shields between the bikes, a room full of people breathing hard and just producing respiratory droplets all over the room that in an enclosed space, that sounds like a disaster. Do it outside. Agreed. Go on that hike. Question about if somebody suspects that they have been exposed, um, do they really need to be quarantined for 10 days or two weeks or, or what is the protocol there? Yeah, so someone who has an exposure to somebody else who's been sick needs to quarantine for 14 days at home. So that 14 is not a made up number. We know that on average, when people are exposed to COVID, it takes usually around five days for symptoms to start showing up, but the range is two to 14 days. That's mostly what we see, that people who are exposed to the virus will start to develop symptoms or they'll test positive if they never have symptoms uh, within those 14 days. So the quarantine window is built on what we call the incubation period. That is how long it takes for somebody to develop symptoms. Now, if somebody starts to develop symptoms during that period, then we can have them tested and they'll determine if they have COVID or not. The reality is that they will be treated as if they have it, if they have symptoms and they've had an exposure. So 14 days, it is based on science. Nobody made it up. There has been in the news in the past very recently uh, some and in some of the literature they're looking at 10 days plus a negative test as, a, as an alternative path uh, right now that is not what public health departments are asking people to do we'd rather be more cautious make sure that people are taking care of themselves and their communities and for those who are healthcare workers or who have other essential jobs their employers might have additional steps that would be the marker of when someone could leave quarantine or leave isolation if they've been sick. So in those cases, you check with your employer. Yeah, I would only add that I'm, I'm hoping that with increased and better testing with, with negative, a negative test or two, we might be able to decrease that and chip away at that upper end. Um, and I've certainly heard the stuff about 10, but we're we are certainly seeing patients who present at day 13 after that clear exposure with symptoms and then test positive. They're on the outside of the bell curve, but they're absolutely there. And we're gonna maybe do one or two more questions. Um, somebody was asking, what are one or two things that you wish people would do? If they're already following guidelines, are there other things that they can be doing to help? Oh, hi. Um, <laughs> that they can be uh, doing to help with um, the situation. What do I wish people would do? Stay home and don't go to the barbecue. I know you're tired. I'm tired too. I haven't worked an under 55 hour week in probably eight months and I'm, I'm tired. I get it. Y'all want to go out. We all want to go out. I want to go to the store. I want to go hang out with my friends. And I acknowledge as your epidemiologist on this call, I acknowledge you and I acknowledge your exhaustion. COVID fatigue is real. So I think what I would want, number one, is acknowledge the COVID fatigue is real and then double down on your efforts to stick with those guidelines because it's very easy to just want to inch away. And then the last piece would be if you are out and about in the community or you are being exposed to people, use all of the right precautions. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Make sure that when you come home, you wash your hands really well, not just with the hand sanitizer. And then I guess I'm going to give a third one. I just have to. If you get a call from a public health worker saying that you've been exposed to COVID, take a deep breath. Don't panic. We're here to help. And just answer the call. That's all. All of that a thousand times, yes. You know, we all have to have personal responsibility. It sucks. We're all doing this too. Um, it's hard. Keep keep doing all this stuff. I think if we as a country had done this a few months ago collectively, we'd all be doing better and we would be able to, we wouldn't be at this point. Um, but I see even really responsible people still saying they do all this stuff and they're like, and and I've just booked this incredible vacation. Uh, spot up in Paho where 16 of us are going to get together, but it, it's okay. We're all going to get tested and 
you know, they all got tested two weeks before this event. And it's, I mean, this is just, I get it, but we all have to set, you have to, we all have to do the hard stuff, you know, sure. Go outside with a few, have, you know, have drinks out in your backyard with a few friends, go for walks with people, but we've got to avoid these big events, especially indoors. Yeah. We probably have to give up the indoor gym. Do not be in a rush to go back to indoor restaurants. Do not be in a rush to go back to bars. I think every state that's opened up indoor bars has seen exactly where that's gone. Um, Kentucky was doing so well until the bars opened. Yeah, it's going to be yeah. hard. Well, and but, as a, a final question, um, and I, I know that there are a ton of questions and very specific questions with, with a lot of details, and I wish I could get to all of them. Um, and if you, as an attendee, are interested in doing perhaps another version of this or a, a second Q&A session at some point with, with these fine experts or, or some other folks, um, please let us know, because I, I would love to get that information, because if this is valuable to you, I want to provide that. Um, but as a, as a final question, how are you personally preparing to manage to stay healthy physically and emotionally um, during the winter months when we're all still going to be in indoors? You know, it depends on where you are in the country. For me in the Northwest, we hit a lot of rain up here, uh, but I'm not afraid of the rain. Once you live out here long enough, you're okay with that. So I'm planning to try to spend as much time outside as I actually can, even though it's going to be a little rainy and a little dark. And maybe that's just taking care of my garden or walking my dog a little bit longer, but really getting a little bit of that vitamin D that we're all missing up here in the Northwest. So that's part of it. But the other part for me, at least, is establishing some real structure, making sure that I make space for myself to be tired and acknowledge that, you know what, the mental and physical fatigue of being in your home and going through this outbreak together, it's real, it is documented, we have scientific evidence, you are not dreaming it up and you're not alone. So for me, making space to acknowledge what I'm actually feeling and say, hey, it's okay for me to have a tired day where I stay in my pajamas and answer emails from bed. That's all right sometimes, but also, creating structures so that each day we have time where we set aside to maybe do some good stretches in the morning, make sure we're having our meals so that we are nourished throughout the day the way that we need to be and making sure we get really good sleep. Yeah, that's a great answer. Maybe we're gonna to have to change our structure of our days a little bit as days get shorter and there's limited, uh, there's limited light. Am, am I gonna to have to break up my work day a little bit more to have more of a break during the day saying that I'm going to need time to exercise outdoors or even see friends outdoors because it's going to be cold and dark or rainy um, at night. I think it's going to be challenging when flu hits. I think it's going to be so much more challenging in places where it gets really cold and snows a lot. Um, anything you can do to maximize your ability to socialize outdoors and it's going to help a lot. Be kind to yourself. Well, with that, I think we will say thank you to our two fabulous experts, uh, Dr. Maayan Simkas and Dr. Guy Shohat. Um, you've been wonderful. I really appreciate your time and your your expertise on all of this um, and had a bunch of people saying, yeah, we should do this again. So I'll, I'll be in touch. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for coming. I have just a few things that I want to share with you. So next week, next Thursday, on Thursday, September 3, our next event is going to be Back to the Night, the Case for Dark Skies with uh, Mary Coolidge, who is Portland Audubon's Bird Safe Campaign Coordinator. And she's going be talking about um, birds specifically, but lots of different animals and, and why we should be turning off lights and, and science around that and, and um, dark night uh, related issues. So if you are interested in, in animal health and human health and related to um, circadian rhythms and that sort of thing, I encourage you to come join us next week on Thursday, September 3. And quick thank you to our patreon supporters these are all the people who are supporting at ten dollars or more a month i keep having to um, reduce the font size on the names because we keep growing and i am so very grateful to all of you for doing that so thank you um, it really means the world to us and 
Also, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a donation event. We want to make this available to as many people as possible, um, but we do have bills to pay. So if you are able to, um, we are most grateful for any donation of any size. You can join us on Patreon, as I mentioned, um, or you can make a one-time donation through our nonprofit partner, which is Make You Think is the organization. And you can go to makeyouthink.org slash support and make a donation there. And again, pardon me, again, thank you all so much for coming and for wanting to learn about this thing that is affecting all of us. So have a good evening and we hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks. <laughs>